I'm Alana. I'm coming to you from uh, the beautiful island of Unamagi, Cape Breton. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about one of those complex um, issues that really, really is important to all of us. Okay, so it, it, Kate's diagram showing the complexity of this landscape couldn't couldn't be any better in my opinion, than really showing it. And, and this is another aspect of that. And this is the pollinator piece. And, and I'm going to really show you why that's important and where we are in terms of our pollinators um, and how important this particular landscape is in Nova Scotia. As Jeremy said, and as Kate said, so just to really drive this point home, we are showing a lot of signs of degradation in our landscapes, no question about it. And this diagram that I have here really sums up what's happening to the bees. We have a lot of problems. We have, we have you know, our pesticide applications, particularly in the dike land, uh, landscape, right? So where we're talking about um, in Nova Scotia is the, the main part of uh, uh, where a lot of the students are doing their, their, um, their projects is in the western uh, side of Nova Scotia um, and in, in the Annapolis Valley. So we have a lot of heavy agriculture uh, in these areas, which is really, really important. As Jeremy said, we're, ha we're starting to see the urbanization, the development that's happening all at the same time. So, and, and with climate change, we're seeing these changes with our bee communities. And I like to point out to people because a lot of people don't really understand in Canada, we have close to 900 different wild species that are important for our pollination of not only our agricultural crops, our beautiful floral diversity that we have all over Nova Scotia and this area, this region is no different. So these pollinators are extremely important. And in Nova Scotia, out of those 900, we have 250 species. The majority of them actually nest in the ground and they don't nest very far down uh, from the surface of the ground. They're usually about 20 centimeters from the top. So very, very close to the top um, in their, uh, the plant species that they actually pollinate. We have a lot of species that are actually nesting in dike lands in shrub habitat and in shrub uh, vegetation. Uh, in our cavity nesters, and then the dead wood that we, uh, that we see that we run over, that we jog over when we're on these dike lands. We have a lot of bumblebee colonies, and I'm going to talk about uh, one in particular that's really, really important um, in this research. But I find it's very important to make sure that people really understand the complexity of why this is so important. Our wild pollinators actually pollinate our crops in Nova Scotia better than our managed crops. So these species are extremely important. Why? Because this is, this is what our diets are going to look like. If we keep having this decline, we are going to have the diets on the right. We are going to have potatoes, corn, and I hope everyone likes mushrooms, because that's what our diets are going to look like without our wild pollinators. We are everything that you see on the left is pollinated by wild pollinators. And we need insect visitation to these crops in order to have all of this. So we have our apples, which as we know, are very important to the Annapolis Valley. We have blueberries, we have carrots. The only thing here that's not in this picture that I would like to point out is coffee is also pollinated. So when we all had no power this weekend, can you imagine how bad it would be if you didn't have coffee too? Mm, not very good. So what would happen? What would happen to our crops in Nova Scotia if we lost the wild bees? Someone, a, a colleague of mine, Alexander Klein in 2007 actually quantified what would be the loss of main crops um, if we lost our wild pollinators. And what it actually works out to is one in three mouthfuls of every bite of food that you take is the result of pollination. The maritime region in Canada, this is how important pollination is to the maritimes, produces 29% of Canada's fruit and berry production. I'd like to point out that that's well over Ontario's 15%. This is a major economical driver for Nova Scotia and the Maritimes. 
we need to ensure our wild pollinators are sustained in the dike land landscape because of that. If our wild pollinators are to decline to the point where we don't have them and we can't rely on them anymore, as you can see in the photos here, we will lose up to 90% of the crops that are under the 90%. So we will lose 90% of our apple varieties, 90% of our cherries, we will lose our squashes, we will lose our, our watermelon, our tomatoes. These crops require and are dependent on these pollinators. And it's a very, very important thing for uh, the dike lands. Now, to really explain what where we are in Nova Scotia, I would like to point out that for all these crops, so the crops that rely on these pollinators in this particular sensitive ecological area in Nova Scotia, we lack the information. 53% of the locally grown crops in the valley area do not, we do not know what actually is pollinating the crops, let alone living in that area. And you can see here, so for the field fruits and vegetables, we actually do not have adequate information and pr uh, present data for what's pollinating our cucumber, our pumpkins, our peas, our field tomatoes, and our peppers. That is outstanding and scary to think that we do not know where our wild pollinators are actually pollinating these crops in the Maritimes, knowing how important they are and how sustainable our management practices in these particular crops are. So everything that I have here in red, we do not have uh, present data for. The last uh, information that we have for a lot of these crops is, uh, crops is well over 20 years old. So with climate change and with everything that's happening in, in this area, this, in, this um, uh, pollinating work being completed in the dike lands is very, very important. And there have been several students that have been doing uh, several studies on surveying the area to determine what pollinators are actually living in dike lands, what, ecos what pollinators are actually servicing the dike lands in comparison to the wetlands and how the ecosystem services in these particular habitats are actually uh, feeding into the agricultural crops that are very, very close to them. And I would like to point out uh, something about wild pollinators that not a lot of people really realize. We're talking about very, very small areas. A wild bee species cannot fly any more than two kilometers. And that's really if it's a great day, if it's, there's no wind, uh, the conditions are great, and a bumblebee will only fly, again, in very optimal conditions, two to three kilometers at max. So all the agricultural habitat in the dike land landscape that is actually really close to these important habitats will be feeding into those, um, those agricultural uh, crops. I want to show you before I hand it over to Danica that the uh, graduate student and the honor student that have been working on the pollination aspect of the dike land landscape actually have found 76 species. So 30% of Nova Scotia's fauna, the 250, have been living in these habitats. That is a, a, an outstanding number that are, are being found there. Two things of importance that I want to point out to you, three actually. This is Lazy Oglossum Tayloray down here. This is a new record for Nova Scotia. It has never been recorded before um, and it was recorded in a, wet, in a marsh habitat, in a salt marsh habitat, which is really, really neat. This is the most common species that is found in a dike land landscape. It's Halictus ligatus and this Bumblebee species here is actually a species of concern for Kosiwik. Um, so we are finding very rare and very specialized uh, uh, species that are living in these important habitats. And I also have a little photo here on the right. This is the little nest of Lazioglossum tayloray. So it's a very, very small nest. Um, and a lot of people actually confuse it with an anthill.
So every time, if someone is, is walking on the dike land, please pay attention to where you're walking and really look to see who is actually sticking their head out of this little hole. And I can guarantee you it's probably uh, a little species. So I would like to end by acknowledging the students that really worked hard in doing the surveying on the dike land habitat um, and in the salt marshes. Terrell, Evan, and Houston have incredible skill. Identifying bees is not easy and learning 76 new species in two years is a lot of work and I would really like to thank them uh, for everything that they've done. So over to you, Danica. Thanks, Selena. Great, I think we're, we're okay here. It, look, it looks great. Okay, thanks, Anne. So I'm gonna be kind of pulling us all, all together, just completing the picture of some of the really important um, components and ecosystem services that we're looking at within the dike lens. And particularly in my case, with regards to the restored ecosystems and the and the um, the coastal wetlands, so I'll be focusing on talking about the regulating services, primarily coastal protection and carbon sequestration, and really drawing upon some of my colleagues also that are conducting and graduate students that are conducting the work at Acadia University in Saint, Saint Francis and Saint FX. So globally, salt marshes are recognized as increasingly. Um, the importance as natural forms of coastal protection. And the salt marshes that are found in front of the dike, as Jeremy's indicated, are really the first, they're the foreshore marshes, and they're the first line of defense for many of our coastal communities uh, that we find within internationally and within the, the Bay of Fundy as well. And there's increasing international acceptance of the building with nature approach, providing additional co-benefits of ecosystem services and carbon sequestration. There are three primary protective services of foreshore marshes. These include the attenuation of waves, the stabilization of sediments, as well as the accretion of sediments themselves. And there's been a lot of empirical evidence that, that have been gathered over the years to really quantify a lot of these different, different benefits. And you can see on the image on the, on the lower left-hand side that um, in the Duantadal article, really looking at a lot of those protective, protective functions. Wave attenuation capacity, one of the primary impacts in terms of protective functions is that ability of the wave of the vegetation itself to attenuate the wave act action. And that means making, reducing the height of a wave um, coming into our foreshore infrastructure um, or our shorelines and doing so um, also reducing the wave energy. So wave attenuation capacity varies depending on the water depth and significant wave height. So significant wave height really is just the, it's a statistical measure, measurement of, of a proportion of the waves coming into a particular area, but it's what we really use to help um, understand what is the amount of energy that's going to be impacted on a particular area. Now, an experiment that we conducted um, as part of Resident, but also the NRC's, the National Research Council, National Research Council, sorry, a natural um, uh, nature resilience project. Um, uh, Maka, as an honor student in ENVS at, at St. Mary's University, she was really quantifying how much, how effective is this wave energy being attenuated within a our primary colonizer, Spartan Alterna flower canopy. And what she found is that the we can have actually a very pronounced um, decrease in, in, in wave height as these, these, the waters come into the salt marsh habitat. And for areas where we have depth of water, which is less than the vegetated canopy and, and less than one meter above the vegetated canopy, so the vegetation itself occupies more of the water column, we have about 80% decrease in wave height within the first 10 meters of marsh. So that's incredibly effective. Now, and this is for a 20 centimeter wave coming into the system. Now, if we're looking at water depths that are much greater than that over the foreshore itself, um, and where the vegetation itself doesn't occupy the majority of the canopy of the actual water column, this actually decreases. And so 
wave height is reduced by only 3% in the first 10 meters of the, of the marsh surface and 62% at about 50, 50 meters based on empirical evidence that we have within a young, a gently sloping Spartana work. And this work is continuing in, in, the, upper, in the upper bay, looking at sort of the, those higher marsh platforms. But what this means for us in terms of quantifying the protective function of the mar of foreshore marshes is that it's not one size fits all and that we really need to account and consider um, what is the actual elevation of that mat marsh platform and the empirical evidence that we're gathering is allowing us to actually kind of quantify and provide recommendations about a minimum width of foreshore that would provide the coat the the additional benefits of decreasing stress and energy and erosional forces on the actual dike infrastructure itself. One of the really cool things about tidal marshes is that they are considered to be resilient ecosystems. And this is primarily due to their ability to self-engineer and rise up within the tidal frame as the sea levels actually rise. They're able to do so through plant production, adding root biomass, and also trapping sediments that come in from each tide. A lot of our projects then therefore leverage this self-engineering capacity, and the majority of sites within the Bay of Fundy are fully vegetated within two to five years post-restoration, as seen in the Belcher Making Room for Wetlands um, salt marsh site that you see on the far right hand side. And this capacity to rise up, to so self-engineer and rise up within the, within the tidal frame really speaks to that resilience. And one of the, the additional co-benefits of this process is through carbon sequestration. And the, we're looking at an image of our of the Converse making room for wetlands, wetlands site at the border of between New, New, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And it really sort of demonstrates a variety of the, the different factors and features that occur through, tidal through carbon sequestration. So tidal wetlands sequester carb organic carbon through two primary mechanisms. One, photosynthetic organisms such as plants and algae take up CO2 from the atmosphere and convert it to energy through photosynthesis, sequestering carb um, carbon primarily into their roots and their tissues some of which eventually get stored in the soils as non-living biomass or litter. These are referred to as autochthonous sources as they're generated from within the marsh system itself. But the above and below ground components of the vegetation itself in the coastal wetlands also receive and trap sediments and organic carbon with every tide. And these are referred to as alloctonous sources of carbon. And understanding the relative contribution of, of autochthonous and loctonous inputs of organic carbon is important when converting carbon accumulation rates to carbon stocks and potential for carbon credits. The very high suspended sediment concentrations within the Bay of Fundy and the low-lying lands between the dikes mean that in managed realignment sites, such as those that we've already discussed, carbon accumulation occurs really rapidly. Now this graph shows carbon accumulation rates with volume of new sediment, with volume, sorry, with volume of new sediment on the y-axis and on the x-axis, we're looking at a year since restoration. Now this graph shows carbon accumulation rates over six years at a managed realignment site uh, at OLAC. And this was a Ducks Unlimited restoration about almost 10 years ago now. And what they found in what Woodlandberg found within, within their study is that we accumulate carbon at about five times faster than mature or natural reference, reference sites. But it's not so straightforward and simple. Um, and we need to start to understand carbon cycling and the protection of organic carbon in salt marshes and the spatial variability in the carbon pool to better more accurately predict carbon stocks. Our Buscura mycorrhizae fungi, or AMF, attach themselves to the roots of their host plants, uptaking nutrients from the soil and transferring them to their host plants, as you can see in the left-hand diagram. The plant then provides a carbon source. And in fact, plants can allocate about 10 to 30% of their photosynthetic carbon to AMF. On the right-hand side, you are looking at ink-stained um, ink -stained slides of the magnified, about 200 magnification of AMF 
uh, colonized within three different roots of, of tidal wetland, wet, wetland plants. Now the high, it's indicated in blue with the high AMF staining, and this is the work of the PhD candidate Kendra Sampson, um, or S Sampson. The Hymar species Spartana pectinata, which is actually a uh, new name of uh, Sporopolis, uh, on in the C, the C panel here, um, exhibited higher colonization rates to the other two species, with the highest colonization rates at 92 to 94 percent found in old restored and referenced salt marshes. This really shows, um, allows us to really get a better handle and understanding about where in this, the spatial distribution of where uh, organic carbon is actually being stored within the marsh system and the importance of looking at these different microhabitats and the relationship between different vegetation zonation and understanding our carbon stocks. The Understanding the spatial distribution of organic carbon content across coastal ecosystem is a really important factor in determining carbon credits as frameworks such as the verified carbon standard methodology require project areas to be stratified to account for spatial variability in our um, organic carbon stocks. And to date, we really don't have a really strong understanding of that spatial variability. And what are some of the variables that impact that the actual um, stability of that of that carbon pool. So that's really some of the fundamental questions that a lot of the work that we're doing within ResNet are really trying to be able to achieve. Because accurate quantification of carbon stocks and flood protection for nature climate change adaptation, such as managed dike realignment, is important for decision making and understanding the trade-offs between maintaining dikelands and restoring wetlands. On the left-hand side, these are some of the tidal, new tidal waters that are being reintroduced in the Onslow North River Tidal Wetland, Race, Wetland Race Restoration Project being conducted uh, in just adjacent to the town of Truro. These are the tidal bore coming in. So these are large projects. This um, managed realignment is a fundamental tool that we have as Nova Scotians to respond to climate change impacts. And we're at a really in, really exciting nexus right now of a lot of international engineering guidance and standards, as well as the science that's going to be helping us make these, these very challenging decisions in order to make our coastal communities within the, the Atlantic climate um, a lot more a lot more feasible. And certainly this work is not, uh, not without a wide range of students, many, many supporters, and a variety of different funding funding environments. So just acknowledge the, the, the range and diversity of students that have worked with, it, with, with us, and we're always happy to answer any questions. We do have a lot of information on our Transcoastal Adaptation website that I know that Anne has mentioned, um, and I, we're going to wrap it up here and, and have time for questions. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. So that was fascinating. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. And the way maybe we'll do this is I, I see that there are some questions already in the chat. So you can either ask your question to a specific one of our four speakers or throw it out on the floor and I'll let you all fight over who will answer the question. Um, and so you can also, add to all of our uh, guests, you can feel free to take off your mic and ask the question, just raise your hand and ask the question, or you can put it in the chat and I can answer it if you're feeling a bit shy or if your microphone isn't working very well. And Brent, I'll start with your question because I, I see it on here. Um, so Brent Robichaud uh, asks a question, and this is in relation to Alana's work. I guess I never thought about it before, but are all the different types of produce all being grown on the, are, are different types of produce being grown on dike lands and are certain crops more likely to be grown on dike lands versus maybe more inland farms, I think uh, maybe is what the question's asking. And do we know more or less about the pollinators for these dikeland crops or kind of crops grown in farmlands that aren't right next to dikes, if that makes sense to you, Alana? Um, it, it does. Um, great, great question. The answer is yes, no, no. Um, we, we do have um, an idea of what is being grown on or what I should say, I'll start with the last part of that. 
we do have an idea of what pollinators are found on the crops from other regions, not necessarily from Nova Scotia, which is why this work is so important. So we have an idea um, from work from colleagues in British Columbia, what they're finding um, in cucumber uh, fields. We're, you know, there's work in Ontario, what, you know, my colleagues are finding in field tomatoes, what's pollinating them. So I have an idea of how many solitary ground nesters that we should find particular species that will be different um, because what we find in the West Coast in comparison to the East Coast will obviously be a little bit, um, a little bit different, but we can expect similar proportions of cavity nesters versus solitary ground nesters and social uh, ground nesters and bumblebee species as well. Um, the middle part of that um, are certain crops more likely to be grown in dike lands. We see a lot um, in this particular region of field fruits and vegetables, which is um, really, really interesting because that's where the information on our pollinators lacks the most for Nova Scotia is our field fruits and vegetables. So this will in, you know, not only provide information on the importance of dike land uh, pollinators, but also is going to be really tapping into um, the agricultural side and how um, farmers can really maintain their land to make sure that they're increasing their, their pollinators and maintaining the pollinators that they have. Um, and the first part of that was, I well, I forget the first part. I will hold on, I'll, go, I'll just go to the chart. Are different types of produce being grown on the dike land? Again, we have a lot of the field uh, fruits and vegetables, not necessarily um, the orchards really, really close. They tend to be a little bit further away. And as I pointed out, with um, the wild bee species that we find or we have in this area, we're talking very small, small areas, one to two kilometers. So they, they really it's whatever is adjacent um, to uh, to the dike lands that that will be feeding into agricultural fields or feeding into um, orchard habitat. And Brent says thanks. Okay, I'll open the floor to further questions, and if not, of course, I have many. As people think, I will go ahead. So Danica, this is a question for you. How are you measuring wave height? What, what kind of instrumentation are you using to measure? I, and I guess it wasn't wave height as much as the force. So wave height, what we do is we use, um, a, we put a series of instruments that are wave sensors in a transect. And what you do, you have is it's a, it's a, it's a basically a standardized methodology where you have five uh, wave sensors called RBR sensors that are established from uh, in a shore perpendicular transect. One is on the unvegetated mudflat, and then you have the next one at the actual edge of vegetation and moving inward. Um, and the measurements are made relative in order to normalize against different um, wave heights coming into the system, all the data are normalized against that RBR1, that, that initial station, so that you then are able to have a normalized um, comparator to look at how that initial wave height is, um, is reduced and the energy is dissipated as we actually move further into the actual system, system itself. And so it's a, would it be like a flow meter on there? And then it, it's a pressure transducer that can measure at a pretty at a high at a high frequency to look at the fluctuations in that in the water levels that are coming into the system. And my follow up question to those is: Have you lost any of these? I'm assuming very <laughs> expensive units in the crazy tides. <laughs> I don't know how you that, guys do research in salt marshes. <laughs> that's a great question. So um, fortunately, we have we lost one camera, um, our, we because we also have video cameras to to kind of record. We have not lost the instrument, although we did have a period of significant stress when we found out um, from the manufacturer um, that they shouldn't be exposed to air uh, with sub like significant freezing temperatures. So we. 
yeah, and since our instruments were exposed uh, to the air during some of those sub-zero, very cold temperatures in December, uh, there was potential for damage. Thankfully, they're all going to calibration. They're, they're all fine, but um, yeah. It's also why we can't measure in winter, getting taken out by an ice block um, and also exposed during the, uh, the low tide. Yeah, the safety concerns. Oh, I, I, I'll stop talking and instead read the questions that people are putting forward. Um, but if we have time, I want to hear more about the, the insanity of the field work. So I have a question from Brent. Can someone touch on how the, how the farmers see these efforts? And if a dike land is converted to salt, salt marsh, I assume this may require a loss of agricultural land, although maybe this is not the case. Oh, Danica, if you want to kind of chime in here and talk about Brandon's work, it seems like a good fit. Yeah, abs absolutely. Both Brandon's work and also the case study that we're looking at uh, at, at Belcher. Um, so certainly there is mixed, mixed reviews in terms of how how managed realignment, dike realignment is actually perceived. Uh, and a, a lot has to do with the individual's experience with the actual restoration taking, taking place. So in sites where a farmer, for example, has received, I would say a direct benefit of the managed realignment process. So for example, at the Belcher Street managed realignment site, the farmer um, was able to benefit with increased um, access, better access to his remaining agricultural land. He got rid of land that was um, fallow, that was what that was flooding, or that was had really poor drainage, so was not really effective. Um, and so, by allowing that land to go back to tidal wetland uh, habitat. Um, he was able to then get uh, better access um, for his his heavy machinery to actually access and farm the rest of rest of his dike. So there's there's trade offs. It also became a really good uh, recreational use trail, and and people were commenting on seeing butterflies in the area that they they hadn't seen before um, as a result potentially of that that new wetland coming into to that particular area. Um, but certainly views are mixed. Um, it really depends on people's personal um, uh, experience with actually restoration. And some of the things we're really trying to do is increase the awareness um, of the process uh, and the, the sequence and the trajectory of these, of these restorations so that people can understand what to expect. Um, you know, the first couple of years are going to be nasty and muddy. They're, they're not pretty. Um, but that then leads to those significant, significant benefits. So there's a lot of work underway um, and uh, a bit of public education as well to be able to help people visualize and see that this is possible um, and it, it is a way forward. And I don't know whether Kate, you wanna to add to, to any of that as well. Well, I was just gonna say that there is this decision-making process in the marsh body is that the people who own land that's protected by a dike are part of a kind of a communal decision-making process that's a long kind of held right. And so the conversations about what's going to happen on that land is always um, a, done with that, it's called a marsh body, and, and they get to vote on whether or not they support the change in land use and land cover that's, that's proposed. And, and sometimes that process takes a while, but uh, one that I kind of wrote up for uh, the North Onslow uh, case study, you know, there was a year and a half, Danica, maybe two years of conversations with that marsh body, bringing in experts. So a real kind of deliberative democratic process to bring everybody to first kind of, a lot of these marsh bodies are no longer active and they, 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 they become uh, told that, hey, you actually have a common interest here and you have actually a common responsibility to make this decision. It's like, we don't do that in any other context. And then they deliberate and they make a decision and it was a unanimous, unanimous vote. And I think um, that kind of thing really influences what's possible when you see people think really hard about it, make a call, some farmers, some not farmers. Uh, so it's, it's a fascinating process that's kind of idiosyncratic and delightful. <laughs> Thank you. So we have now, of course, a slew of questions. And I, I know our speakers have to run at 8.30, but I'll try to get through them as fast as I can. We have a number of thank yous. Um, 
And one question from Pat Whitten is whose responsibility, who is the, the kind of the governing body of the marshlands, the feds or provincial government, and who pays the shot for rec any reclamation or restoration that's done? I guess I'll jump in, jump in for that one. In, um, it's really variable. So the responsibility for the dikes themselves and the dike infrastructure is the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture who are responsible for, for that. Uh, and that's regulated and the activities are regulated under the Agriculture Marshlands Act. Um, but in terms of any, uh, any restoration or managed realignment uh, that, as Kate mentioned, that does have to have the, the two-thirds majority vote of the marsh body. Um, the, as the province is responsible for the dike infrastructure, uh, they are able to, they have a small budget, but they are able to apply to the federal government through the Disaster Mitigation Adaptation Fund, for example, um, which is a project they have currently. And you can find more information on that if you just Google um, working with the tides. Uh, and so those federal funds are available to provide um, uh, management activities within the dike land. And one of those out of a number of seven different options, um, managed realignment or tidal wetland research are one of the seven options. Uh, and so there is a, an actual um, vetted and uh, very categorized framework that the province now undergoes to determine what type of, of management activity may occur within an individual dike land itself. Uh, and some of, of a particular portion of a, of a dike land, for example, may undergo a um, variety of different options. Some may be rising the dike higher, some may be managed, um, managed realignment, but there is a process now for a standardized process for deciding where um, marshes are going to be restored uh, and where dikes are gonna be rising up. Um, in terms of funding for these types of activities, as I mentioned, the federal government uh, so our, our projects, Making Room for Wetlands, were funded by the Coastal Restoration Fund, the Department of um, uh, Fisheries and Oceans. There are also compensation funds. So if there are landowners that do wish to um, sell or, 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 or their land uh, to be restored to tidal wetlands, they can connect with the Department of Agriculture about, about those particular activities. Um, but once again, that is uh, a collective decision that is made within a group of landowners that are within the marsh body itself. That's very complicated. It is. <laughs> wow, that is. And so I, I am gonna, I have one question that I hope you don't mind squishing in. Yep. Um, Carol Madge is, first off, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm wondering if there's a potential for farmers who willingly give up their farmland to be restored to wetland to be compensated through these carbon credits through the increase in carbon sequestration? Um, that's an excellent question. And at present, there is not a direct carbon market um, to be able to be gained through that. Um, and it's only right now through habitat compensation credits. However, this is, um, this is something that's being discussed at the national scale. And there are efforts underway to have a carbon market, so both in the federal level and in the provincial level. But at the present time, um, there is no standardized accounting mechanism for tidal wetland restoration in Canada to be counted towards these different credits. Um, there are, and that has to do with our, our national inventory and the, the carbon accounting framework, um, but that is certainly something that uh, is being discussed and frameworks are being developed at the national scale. And something I would think that your work will speak to and help inform. Uh, definitely, and that's, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do is provide empirical data to help support those calculations um, and using regionally specific and relevant calculations to inform the carbon markets.